um, this week, but that's the Sunday papers. Now, how do you express your loyalty to Tony Abbott and the Liberal Party? Well, if you're a bloke, you can wear a blue tie. There's another way. You can, uh, you can back his interpretation of the role of the party room in deciding the leader, as Joe Hockey has done. We'll take a look at that as our studio guest, Assistant Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, joins us. It's the Australian people that have the right to remove a Prime Minister, uh, not anyone else. These things are the gift of, of the party room. And remember, our party room is made up of people who are elected by their, by their constituents. So that's how the system works. And I think anyone who um, pretends differently is kidding themselves. It is self-evident that the individual members of the party room are able to elect the leader and the deputy leader of the Liberal Party. That has always been the case, and I imagine it will continue to be the case. Trust Frydenberg, good morning. Welcome. Nice, nice to be with you, Barry. Who's right there, Joe Hockey or Scott Morrison and Julie Bishop? Look, I think Joe Hockey makes a fair point, which is that uh, when 13 million Australians went to the ballot box at the last election, they knew that if the coalition formed government, Tony Abbott would be their Prime Minister. At the same time, it is true that the party room can change the leader. It can be done, it has been done, but there's often a very high price to pay, as the Labor Party showed us. So my view is we shouldn't be changing leader now, particularly because the Prime Minister has only been in the job for less than 80 weeks. So that sounds like an each-way bet, because whichever way you look at it, the rules say the party room can deter does determine the leader. I don't think anyone's disputing what the rules are. I think what they're saying but is well, the interpretation... But when you hear what Joe Hockey said just then, though, doesn't that sort of give a sense that he's saying to the party room, this is none of your business? Well, I think he's also pointing to history here, which is you know, the Australian electorate rejected the six years of chaos and dysfunction that the Labor Party gave us, and they did change leaders, and we saw the Australian people give them the lowest primary vote in 100 years in 2013. I don't think the coalition, led by the Liberal Party, should be going down that path, particularly, Barry, as ever since the formation of the Liberal Party by Sir Robert Menzies in the mid-1940s, we've never, ever thrown out a Prime Minister in their first term. John Gordon... Was John, thrown out. Well, John Gorton came to the leadership in 1968. In 1969, he won an election. In 1971, he used his own vote to take himself out of the leadership. Look what happened. We got Gough Whitlam in 72. That wasn't a good outcome for the Liberal Party. Is there any prospect of the leadership coming to a head again this week? I hope not. Look, there's certainly going to be members of my own side uh, who want to see a change in leader. And it only takes two. But I don't think anything the Prime Minister does will convince them um, that, he, that he should stay in their role. I mean, if he delivered the Gettysburg Address, if he won a Nobel Prize, they'd still take the position that they want a change in leader. My view, though, Barry, is that is a minority view. And it's impossible for you to say with any certainty, isn't it? Because it only takes two backbenchers, as we just covered three weeks ago. Absolutely. It just takes two, and that's their right in the party room. And if two did step up... Do you think the result will be different this time around? Look, you're asking me to speculate about speculation, and I just don't think it's very helpful to do that right now. All right, let me ask you to speculate again, <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> if there was to be a successful spill, would Julie Bishop, as the deputy, be entitled to run? Look, Julie Bishop has said that she supports the Prime Minister like we all do, and I don't want to go down that path because I'm very confident that Tony Abbott has the support of the party room I mean, look, just a few weeks ago, as you pointed out, we had this spill motion. It was defeated 61 to 39. Many people who were pushing this spill motion thought they had the numbers. They didn't. We've got a budget to prepare for. We've got a state election in New South Wales. Uh, Mike Baird is ahead in the polls. I don't think it's fair to him to continue this destabilisation. You have got a budget to prepare for, and if you stick with the leadership and then you decide sometime down the track mm. in June or July that it's not working out, and Tony Abbott is replaced, that would be a vote of no confidence in a second budget. Well, let's not go down that path too, because I think we've learnt the lessons of the first budget, uh, and uh, I think you know, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, it has to be pointed out, Barry, that Tony Abbott had an eight-point jump in the polls after the leadership spill. Now, that eight-point jump was the largest single jump in 18 months. On the two big issues of economic security He's eight points in front of the Labor Party. On the other big issue of national security, he's 20 points in front of the Labor Party. If the guy was given some clear air 
I mean, he's shown what he's been able to do in just the last couple of weeks. He's visited a dozen electorates. He's been out there in Rockhampton with the victims of Cyclone Marsha. He's been in New Zealand on bilateral relationships with, with John Key. He's made some significant announcements around the Foreign Investment Review Board, cleaning up the submarine project uh, issue. Sure, but, and I think, you know, I think he deserves a fair go. But he, with Joe Hockey, messed up the budget, though. You said there were lessons to be learned from the budget. Absolutely. And what we, were they? Well, the, for example, around the Medicare co-payment, the big lesson is you need to consult more broadly with the, the relevant stakeholders in the industry, get their support before going forward with a major and change. And because you didn't, you now abandon the whole concept. Well, let, I'm not going to preempt any decisions that will be made this week, but it's clear from what the Prime Minister has said that there will be significant changes around those health decisions. But that's a bit sad, isn't it, for those who want reform? Well, we're committed to reform. That's why, under us, the debt will be $170 billion lower than it would be under Labor. But we've got a very difficult situation in the Senate, and you've got the Labor Party blocking uh, savings that they took to the last election. After the last um, the failed leadership uh, spill motion, um, you voted against it in support of uh, Tony Abbott, I presume, and yet immediately yes. afterwards you were the first MP to, to call into Malcolm Turnbull's office. Well, as we know, we were walking, I was walking past, uh, back to my office and back past the Prime Minister's office. Malcolm was there. I get on very well with him. He's a valued colleague. I went into his office. We had a chat and uh, we continue to talk regularly. What were you talking about? We were talking about the, the, the spill motion that was just defeated and, uh, you know, clearly uh, about how we all need to get back to business. You inadvertently said on radio this week that Malcolm Turnbull had made a good Prime Minister. Of course, you were talking about Tony Abbott, but would he make a good one? Look, uh, Malcolm Turnbull is a very good cabinet minister, a very good communications minister. I won't make that mistake again. But you can just laugh at yourself when you, when you make a little slip up like that. But the truth is, Tony Abbott has been a fantastic leader in opposition. I think he's done a lot in government. I mean, those free trade agreements are going to set Australian jobs up for, for decades to come. I'm very proud of what he's achieved, but also I'm very excited about the future. Just on other matters, and you've been given a lot of credit for what you've done with red tape sure. uh, in this country, but despite your best efforts, it seems that red tape is back in vogue. You look at what's <laughs> happening now with the, with the foreigners buying agricultural land, buying housing in Australia, food labelling, wherever you look, there's red tape being reintroduced. Well, two points. Firstly, we are very proud of the fact that we've cut a $2 billion dollars worth of red tape out of the economy affecting big and small business and the not-for-profit sector. We've had our first couple of repeal days in the parliament. We've really changed the government's attitude from a default position in favour of regulation to making that only a means of last resort. When it comes to residential property, Barry, I think changes do need to be made. We had an extensive uh, committee inquiry through the parliament. It found that there was a lack of consultation between the FERB and immigration departments and other government agencies. It found there was a lack of data that was collected. And would you believe it found that there hasn't been a single prosecution of illegally acquired residential property in this country by foreigners since 2006. Now, quite clearly, we haven't had full compliance in that period. That's why we've proposed an application fee, we've proposed within the ATO a new compliance unit, and we're going to lift the penalties. But will that application fee be $5,000 up to a million, and then 10000 rising incrementally after that? You've decided that will be the figure? That's well, not up for negotiation? No, no. It is all up for negotiation. It's part of a consultation So this process. is not a policy? These are just options? The, this is an options paper that we've put out for discussion because this government is going about its policy-making process in a considered way. All right, way. so can you clear one thing up? For a, for a foreigner wanting to buy a house, do they pay the tax once or do they need to pay it every time that they bid for a house? Well, it's not a tax, it's a fee, and it's very different because it's well, a fee-for-service, Barry. Okay. Because effectively what we're trying to do... How often do they pay it? Do they pay it every time so they what, bid on a house? So as, as it currently applies, if you are a foreign investor wanting to buy, for example, a piece of residential property, um, mm. you have to make an application to the firm. Now, yeah. you do that before you actually buy it, because when you go to buy a piece of residential property, often you have to put in an unconditional bid in. Yeah, yeah, and so, so what we're saying is that you still have to do that before, and now every you'll have time to put you a bid, fee. Every time you bid, you might bid on 20 properties. Well, that's actually part of the consultation paper, because what we would like so to do... you haven't decided whether they should pay every time they bid. But, I, I mean, I think it would make sense to have one fee that goes in that you could use on multiple bids. And then you get your money back if you're not successful? Clearly. Yeah, but that's, that's still to be determined. That's still to be determined. Okay. And I, just th on, I think it's a very important area. Yeah, and, and just on financial advice. Sure. Um, and and I, I assume you've ruled out a Royal Commission, even though some of your senators have said they want, it, want that. How do you think those people who have been ripped off over the years feel about that? 
Well, in terms of a royal commission, um, we are clearly doing a lot of work through the ASIC process in APRA. I mean, the banks are already heavily regulated, but these are very serious allegations in relation to NAB and before that the Commonwealth Bank and Macquarie Bank and so forth. We've had 37 financial planners who have been dismissed. I've spoken to the chairman of ASIC, Greg Medcalf, and he said this is an absolute top priority for them. We've also got a series of reports that we're responding to, including one by a parliamentary joint committee, which was bipartisan, which looks at boosting the professional, the educational and the ethical standards in the sector through an exam, registration processes, code of ethics and so forth. The financial systems inquiry under David Murray has made a number of recommendations. We're looking at increasing the powers for ASIC and we've also got a register which the Labor Party has welcomed which will be in place at the end of this, at the end of this month which will enable people to find out further details about financial planners. Right, so with all that no need for a Royal Commission. That's my view, yes. Alright, thanks for coming in this morning. Appreciate Great to be with you Barry.